welcome to the webinar for the 15th anniversary of the entry into force of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And my name is Rika Nilsson and I'm the facilitator today. I'm going, um, I work in the Biosafety and Biosecurity units of the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. I thank you already now for participating in the webinar. Today we have five speakers that will talk about different elements under the Cartagena Protocol and this is to commemorate the 15th anniversary. Please have in mind also in general that all the views shared sometimes or questions answers might not be exactly the view of uh, CBD but uh, that is fine you know that's part of the discussion. Uh, the webinar is for two hours uh, for any technical support please contact uh, Diego uh, Ochoa so D-I-E-G-O dot O-C-H-O-A at UNDP.org so undp.org or through his Skype, huh? D-O-C-H-O-A. And questions and answers will, will take place at the end of all presentations. Um, however, uh, you're welcome to send in your questions prior to the end of the, um, uh, the presentations and that will also be to Diego. So Diego Ocha at uh, undp.org. And uh, first, briefly, I wanted to say that uh, by safety protocol entered into force uh, 11th of September 2018. And um, the Katana protocol, by safety protocol, could be a simple word not to say, um, uh, is to um, contribute to ensuring the safe transfer, handling, and use of living modified organisms, uh, LMOs, called as a shortening, resulting from modern biotechnology that may have adverse effects on the biological diversity, taking into account risks to human health. And uh, today we have 170 ratifications, the sessions they're called sometimes too, from countries around the world and, uh, and the European Union. And just to mention uh, news also, there, there's eight meetings of the governing body. Uh, our word is, is a con conference uh, of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties. And the next one will be um, 17 to 29th of November 2018, uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. And we will now start the presentations. The first uh, speaker or presentation will be from Tunisia. And so I welcome Hatem Ben Belgazem to uh, start his presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ulrika, for giving me the floor. It's a great pleasure for me to present today on the occasion of celebration of the 15th anniversary, anniversary of the inter entry uh, into force of Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, the Tunisian experience and the best practices on sampling detection and identification of living modified organisms. My name is, but before I would like to introduce myself, my name is Ben Belgesem Hatem. I am the national focal point of Biosafety Clearing House and also member of the unit on Biosafety at the Ministry. Let me now speak in French as the slides were prepared in English. Just, I look for, uh, I will maybe the full screen. Okay, that is good. So, let's begin. Uh, comme beaucoup de pays, la Tunisie avait des défis à relever en matière de biosécurité, notamment la mise en place d'un cadre régional, d'un cadre national et législatif sur la biosécurité, euh, aussi la mobilisation des ressources financières et les activités de formation, là aussi l'appui des intervenants impliqués dans le domaine de la biosécurité, c'est ce qu'on appelle tout ce qui est activité de renforcement de capacité. Euh, un des objectifs et des défis aussi, c'est comment intégrer la biosécurité dans les politiques et les autres secteurs tels que l'industrie, l'agriculture et la santé, et également promouvoir l'éducation, la sensibilisation et la participation du, du public dans ce processus, et ce à travers Euh, des outils de communication très solides. 
OK. Donc, pour faire face à l'impact de l'expansion rapide des OVM résultant de la biotechnologie moderne sur l'économie et l'environnement, la Tunisie s'est engagée dans un processus visant à préserver la santé humaine et la biodiversité et aussi assurer une transparence vis-à-vis -vis de consommateurs. Et ce, à travers plusieurs actions, dont les plus importantes sont la ratification du protocole du Carthagène en 2002, et la, le suivi des activités de renforce, renforcement de capacité des différents projets et aussi les activités de formation, le développement ou la création d'une un, commission nationale de biosécurité et de trois sous-comités sur les aspects législatifs et réglementaires, le réseau de laboratoires de contrôle des OGM, et aussi l'éducation, la communication et les, la participation du public. Il y a eu aussi une création de la Banque nationale des gènes en 2007 et également la création de plusieurs institutions, des centres de recherche et de laboratoires opérant dans le domaine de la biotechnologie. Juste avant d'aller directement dans le vif du sujet et vous parler de notre expérience concernant l'identification et la quantification des OGM, Permettez-moi de vous de mentionner que toutes ces activités ont été entreprises dans, les cadres, dans le cadre des projets de coopération et de renforcement de capacité financés par l'UNEP-GEF. Il s'agit surtout du projet la mise en œuvre du cadre national sur la biosécurité dont la principale agence d'exécution était le ministère en charge de l'environnement par le biais de la Direction générale de l'environnement et de la qualité de la vie et aussi les projets bch 1 et 2 concernant la, le renforcement de capacité pour une participation efficace dans le centre d'échange d'informations sur les risques biotechnologiques. Allons maintenant voir les principales mesures et les bonnes pratiques concernant l'échantillonnage, la détection et l'identification des OVM en Tunisie. Comme j'ai déjà parlé, là je vais vous parler tout d'abord des mesures institutionnelles. Donc il y a eu une création d'un sous-comité au réseau de laboratoires pour le contrôle et la détection des OGM. Ce, ce comité a plusieurs missions. Là, j'ai essayé de vous donner les principales missions, à savoir l'établissement d'un réseau de laboratoires de contrôle officiel des OGM, le support de ces labos dans l'accréditation, dans le processus d'accréditation, assister ce, ce, ce réseau-là réseau dans le développement, l'harmonisation et la standardisation des différentes étapes d'analyse relatives à la détection des OVM. Et aussi fournir un suivi scientifique et organiser les différents ateliers de réflexion et les sessions de formation ayant trait à la matière. Là, j'ai essayé de vous donner principalement le réseau de ces quatre laboratoires de contrôle officiels. Il y en a deux qui relèvent du ministère de l'Industrie, à savoir le laboratoire central d'analyse et des essais et le centre technique de l'agroalimentaire. Un qui relève du ministère chargé de l'environnement, à savoir l'unité OGM qui se trouve dans la Banque nationale des gènes. Et un autre qui relève du ministère de l'Agriculture, à savoir le laboratoire d'analyse des essais et des plans. Parallèlement à ça, donc, on a parlé des aspects institutionnels. Parallèlement à ça, il y avait le renforcement de capacité humaine et matérielle. Là, je vais vous parler tout d'abord de renforcement de capacité matérielle. En effet, il y a eu acquisition et implantation des équipements scientifiques nécessaires à la mise en place d'un laboratoire d'identification et de quantification des OBM à la Banque nationale des gènes. Ce laboratoire est considéré actuellement un laboratoire de référence en matière de contrôle des OGM. Il y a eu également équipement d'autres laboratoires chargés de la détection et de contrôle dont je vous ai déjà parlé tout à l'heure, c'est-à-dire il y a eu un équipement en ce qui concerne l'équipement scientifique et le consommable du labo. Là, je vais vous présenter quelques photos qui montrent ces labos-là. Là, vous voyez le laboratoire, l'unité OGM à la Banque nationale des gènes. À gauche, l'unité OGM au centre technique de l'agroalimentaire. Et à droite, c'est l'unité biologie moléculaire au laboratoire central d'analyse et des essais. Donc là, je vais parler des activités 
ayant trait au renforcement des capacités humaines, c'est-à-dire les acteurs impliqués dans le domaine de la biosécurité. En effet, parallèlement à ça, il y a eu plusieurs, euh, c'est-à-dire on a renforcé les capacités des différents intervenants en matière de biosécurité, et ce à travers la formation scientifique et technique de certains acteurs et chercheurs nationaux en matière de prévention des risques de biotechnologiques, non seulement dans des établissements nationaux, mais aussi à l'étranger. Là, peut-être, je vais citer les lieux, c'est-à-dire ces formations ont eu lieu surtout au Centre de biotechnologie de Sfax en Tunisie, la Banque nationale des gènes, comme j'ai déjà parlé tout à l'heure. Et il y a aussi l'Institut scientifique de la santé publique belge, qui est considéré un laboratoire de référence en matière d'OGM, le Service fédéral belge de la santé publique, le laboratoire OGM qui relève du service commun des laboratoires de Strasbourg en France et l'unité biologique moléculaire, c'est le centre qui relève du centre commun de recherche JRC en ISPRA en Italie. C'est un, un centre européen. Les thématiques, peut-être rapidement, je vais vous parler, les principales thématiques étaient surtout les éléments d'évaluation, de gestion et de communication des risques liés aux OGM, les moyens et les pratiques pour protéger les risques potentiels liés aux OGM, tout ce qui est aspect réglementaire et la détection et la quantification. Donc, comme résultat, il y avait plusieurs résultats. Tout d'abord, il y a eu une utilisation efficace des BCH, puisque plusieurs informations se trouvent déjà dans le BCH et peuvent servir les, les gens opérants ou les, le personnel opérant dans les laboratoires à les utiliser cette gamme d'informations très importante. Il y a eu aussi une préparation des manuels de procédure pour la détection des OGM et l'identification, mais le résultat le plus important, c'est la mise en place d'un réseau de laboratoires de contrôle officiel de, des OGM, et ce à travers la signature d'une convention entre les laboratoires. Cette convention est considérée comme un atout important et un résultat en a important en attendant l'adoption de la loi sur la biosécurité. Bon, rapidement, j'ai essayé aussi de vous montrer les, différentes, euh, les différents supports de sensibilisation ayant trait à la matière et qui ont été produits par euh, l'équipe biosécurité ou par la Tunisie. Il s'agit essentiellement euh, de développement, la traduction, l'édition et la dissémination de quelques guides techniques et publications. Là, je cite le guide introductif à la biotechnologie, la biosécurité et la détection et quantification des OGM en haut. C'est un guide édité en deux langues, français et anglais. Le guide technique d'analyse des risques biologiques liés à l'utilisation d'organismes naturels et génétiquement modifiés. Ici également, il a été édité en deux langues, français et anglais. Et un livret et un CD interactif sur les OGM. Notons que tous ces, ces supports de sensibilisation ont été disséminés à travers le site BCH, les clés USB et les liens Dropbox. Et je voulais partager avec vous que le fait d'avoir cette série intensive de formation pour le personnel ou oui, les acteurs tunisiens impliqués dans le domaine était très bénéfique puisque eux aussi ont pu organiser et former d'autres gens. Là, peut-être je ne vais pas trop m'étaler, juste je, veux, je vais parler de deux ateliers de formation sur la détection des OGM à échelle régionale. Il s'agit de la détection, l'atelier de détection des OGM pour les pays arabes qui a été réalisé à la Banque nationale des gènes en 2016 et un atelier sur la détection et l'identification des OGM pour les pays africains. C'était en étroite collaboration et organisation avec la CBD en mars dernier. Avant de finir ma présentation, je voulais aussi vous informer que l'aspect biosécurité est inclus dans les cours académiques des universités, surtout qui opèrent dans le domaine de la biotechnologie et les institutions de recherche agricole, et que la société civile est impliquée dans ce domaine aussi, surtout l'éducation en termes de biosécurité, par l'organisation de plusieurs caravanes sur la biosécurité. Là, j'ai terminé ma présentation. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention et bienvenue à vos questions. Merci. Well, we thank Hatem um, Ben Belgazem for his presentation, very informative. And uh, once again, we will take questions and so on at the end.
the of the session. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind people that uh, yeah, his, his presentation was in French, and uh, when he spoke, and and the actual what you saw on the screen was English, and we will have another presentation sort of similar like that uh, at a later stage. Um, so uh, you will hear actually presentation in Spanish, but you will see it on screen in English, just so you're aware. Um, but the next uh, presentation or speaker is from Cambodia. So I welcome Pisei Oum from Cambodia to hold his presentation. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> um, today I will present uh, about the risk assessment of living modified organisms for direct use as food, feed, or processing. Um, under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, the word biosafety basically focus on risk assessment, risk management, and risk monitoring. The, yep, I can't show my, why I can't move my slide? Why I can't move my slide to the next slide, sorry? Hi, this is Diego. You can do it uh, with your with your PowerPoint presentation as usual. But I I can move it to the next slide. Oh, here I go. I see. Correct. Thank you. Yes, the uh, the second slide I will present. Basically, uh, I'm sorry. I I just. Oh, would like to introduce myself. My name is Um Pisei from Ministry of Environment. I've been working on the biosafety in 2003 since the uh, MOP1 uh, until uh, last year. So I've been, uh, 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 the National Focal Point has been taken over by another person. But anyway, I'm still uh, on the, the field of biosafety on the public awareness in a different general department for the uh, public understanding awareness on the biosafety. That's why I'm uh, engaging biosafety issue. So uh, let me continue the second slide. Uh, the environmental release of uh, LMO into introduction into the environment, such as uh, GM trees, uh, GM trees or seedlings or crop seed. So any release into the environment uh, uh, has been uh, considered for risk assessment as well. And for LMO for food and feed of our processing is very important in this case, uh, such as, uh, I give you an example, GM corn, tomato or cotton or, or other form of GM rice also. And uh, in the protocol also uh, required for risk assessment under the any elements that is imported for contained use uh, but the reassessment will the procedures is sim more simpler than uh, any exporters of an LMO into the environment uh, you know because they the work in the content use is uh, has set up some uh, strict measures for the LMO to be released into the environment in case any exposures or negligent works. Okay. The obligation under the protocol. The protocol established the rule and procedures from, for any LMO export and import to another country. Uh, that those procedure highlight the advanced and form bigger agreement. You can, you call AIA procedure for intentional release into the environment, introduction into the environment. The AIA 
apply only in the case that country, let's say, importers and exporters, those countries are not party to the protocol yet. So, at AIA uh, uh, can use in that case. But is a recipient country, import country, an exporter want to bring any animal into the import country, then you have to uh, apply domestic law. So that no longer uh, use AIA. So simplify procedure for LMO FAPs. Uh, then you can look for any case that importer require for risk assessment under Annex 2 or the protocol on risk assessment. Uh, and they, yeah, and uh, Annex 3 of risk assessment, which is you, you have to, you can assess for novel uh, phenotype or genotype, you know, any consequence of the uh, effects, any, you can put some recommendation at the end to decision makers and so on. Uh, risk assessment. Uh, you you need to do uh, some evaluation of potential risk. The risk assessment shall be carried out in a scientific manner and case by cases. So even domestic law, our law, let's say Cambodia law on biosafety, you cannot, you could, should not do a general, uh, a single rule to apply in all GM crop or GM uh, LMO that you are intend to do reassessment. You have to do case by case. Some LMO has been identified, has been assessed already in other country, that in, in exported country. So you have to go and look through information that they have been assessed you can look through the VCA central portal and you can do any assessment gap to make sure the publics and decision makers fully understand that before they decide to let Alamo into any, your countries. And that has to be transparent. So that doesn't mean that means you allow public to participate, civil society, farmer association and so on so there there should be some public hearing on this is any uncertainties level of risk you know you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, let public uh, 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 you can set up information so you can uh, let the operator have their own strategy you can set up monitoring plans in the in the long run the main issue, uh, uh, you know, the main issue, what the main issue for under the Katana protocol? Farmer has long time ago, you know, like 4,000 years ago, you know, we, they plant crop using sunlight, you know. So this is, we call conventional method. And by uh, using uh, this traditional method, you can have good test, you know, of uh, uh, any GM, any crop, I'm sorry. Then until now, you have modern biotechnology, you know, scientists uh, just discovered in, uh, in, in, in uh, the earlier 1980s of GM crop. So by using modern biotechnology, creates, um, Great uh, GM crop uh, that boosting productivity than the commercial method. And uh, right now, we in the 21st century, we scientists have apply the you know another technology which is much more modern than the modern biotechnology, than the genetically engineering technology, is a gene a gene editing or 
what we call genome editing, that uh, they use oligo treatment, uh, use a uh, enzyme. The modern biotechnologies uh, commonly use uh, chemical treatment, such as antibiotics. Uh, what are the benefits of Alamo that society uh, in the world has, has benefited? Well, our law, I say Cambodian law, we does not ban any GM products, but we use risk assessment to assess any import into the county to ensure the safety to the biodiversity the safety to human health and the environment. We understand biotechnology has brought a lot of benefit to our society. So, such as, you know, enhancing agriculture, agricultural productivity. In the animal husbandry, you know, you can have a little bit, you know, with less fat. We can have more uh, egg with pharmaceutical or more meal, you know. Uh, you can have a cleaner animal waste by using modern biotechnology. We call a friendly waste, you know. Some ship in Australia, the ship in Australia has outnumbered our human. Uh, so Australian government has I mean, scientists in Australia has invented uh, some, uh, uh, you know, animal feed uh, containing GM product that allowed the sheep to eat. Then the waste from the sheep is cleaner. It's less uh, methane. It's less uh, uh, ammonia. So that means contribute to the environment, contribute to clean air. Food biotechnology, you can have better test of food. You, you can have food with more nutrition. You can have food with clean. In uh, medical biotechnology, you can have, you know, a lot of uh, vaccine, such as uh, diabetes, anti-diabetes, uh, 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 hepatitis. And so on. Uh, in the environmental field, environmental bio biotechnology, you, you can have a genetically microorganism to 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 clean, have clean environment, for clean you know, water, polluted water. You can also release the GE fish into the polluted water. Is the fish uh, show you know the color, you know. Then you can you can see that the water is polluted, but percentage of pollution you cannot do fish to detect until unless you bring water into the lab to test the percentage of water whether it is above or below environmental standard. Alamo food risk. So Alamo food risk to biodiversity, you know, human health. You, you have to think, you know, when you use food uh, from GM for that, it will end up in health. If it, human, if you sell to human, food for eating is, you have to think the viability, whether this, their seed is regrown, can be regrown in somewhere if you thrown away after eating or no. Grain, so you know, but some some genetically modified crop, you can it is hardly to to grow to let grow in a second generation if you if you intend to do on a, a commercial scale because scientists has already do some sterilize, you know. Uh, that not allowed second generation production uh, at large. So 
farmer won't go for that. So they end up in buying seed from the seed industry. So it will, it will not uh, cost, it will not uh, benefit to them. Feed, uh, same thing, you know, commonly in the world, you grow corn, you grow uh, soybean, mainly to sell any more feed. But the animal will end up in human as food. But you have to, to think uh, which part of the uh, uh, animal as they use a sweet for animal which part I can 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 grow which part I cannot so they have to think of uh, impact to biodiversity and impact to animal health as well including the environment what are the risks of animal for for intended for processing processing that's mean like GM corn, you want to do processing yeah, as starch or powder. Uh, you along the way, if you transport, you have to think about negligence. You know, is it dropped somewhere? You know, that in case it's un unintentional, but uh, there's some penalty on that. You know, uh, relation of element to biodiversity, local biodiversity, distance of transport. So. All of these are, are taking into account uh, in terms of processing. When you do, you want to want to let any operator to import it just for processing in your country. You have to think all of this. What does any transport have been taken adequate measures? Any containment that has been uh, set up along the way until they, they are processed? So any uh, awareness of handler in respect to LMO and non LMO counterpart. So that's mean you let must let them know they 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 that's mean the the factory that are producing are processing non GM product non GM core example. What needs to be in place to handle the LMO for SFP? In place, that means what, what are measures to counter in case any country want to import LMO for food or wheat or for processing? Whether you intend to import LMO for on a case by case basis, that means uh, this is the gym corn is intended to use for food, not just for feed, just food. Then you have to do assessment just for food, for human food. And for animal feed assessment would be different from human food. Same apply to processing. But pro this procedure may be take longer or shorter depend on the nature of alamo including the administrative administrative system in in your government in my government any responsibilities any channel of government in your country in my country ministry of environment ministries of agriculture and ministries of commerce any any legislative base uh, basis for implementation of the administrative system. Uh, so Alamo, import Alamo into the country, not just apply one law, but apply maybe apply two or three law. You import, you need, you have to follow trade law. You import Alamo, you have to follow biosafety law. What you plan LMO, you have to follow the agriculture law, including soil law as well. Any regulation administration measure requirement. So under the protocol, it you know it encouraged party should take legal administrative and other media to implement the protocol 
but I think by now, you know, 130 party, or 31, 30. Uh, most of, I think most of party has set up some regulation. It's when the, some, uh, Cambodia has a biosafety law in 2008. Yeah. So in, in, in uh, party also need to ensure handling, transport, packaging, identification of LMO to avoid negative effect on biodiversity. This is under the protocol need regulation to administer. We have a system for enforcement, system to administer, uh, and a system to identification. Cambodia has set up a biotechnology lab and that can detect LMO this time to the country, import to the country. We, this is a regulation that I talked earlier. Uh, we have biosafety law in 2008. We have sub degree uh, to implement the law on biosafety. We have, now we have a draft environment code. We include the regime on liability and redress of any LMO application in case of serious damage into the environment. So in, in, I think I hope in the next two years, the liability and the dress will be uh, passed through the environment of code. Uh, existing instrument and a sub degree on reverse incentive. So we do, we do provide reverse and incentive to any operator that are adhering to a high qualities of environmental standard. Let's say a company that import and release LMO into the environment, uh, comply with environmental standard, we will give a word to them at the end, certain time. And there's some expert to do uh, performance and qualification assessment before giving a, a word to them or certificate or acknowledgement. Uh, we uh, also has a committee, uh, scientific committee, biosafety committee as well, you know, uh, that member who uh, uh, come from different ministry. You know. uh, we develop mode of operation uh including uh, uh criteria guideline of you know for risk assessment we have our own guideline on risk assessment risk management these are uh, a procedure of import lmo into cambodia uh, i point the uh, arrow here you know these these are uh yeah this party uh, operator, importer, notifier, <laughs> you can import to the country. You have to put your application to Ministry Environment here, and the Ministry Environment would have to verify within 90 days from day one to day 90 whether the application are comply with criteria or not. It's not we respond to them within 90 days that your dossier are not qualified or we can put in the same letter that your dossier require more information on this and that then if it is complete we go to here you know independent expert or scientist to do the assessment now we copy it to uh, uh biosafety company we copy to it uh relevant institution here to do have to do reassessment and all the report would send to the ministry environment and with consolidate with consolidation the results of the assessment then we will decide whether to release to approve or not approve approve the condition and so on uh then uh, recommend for decision to sign off. We inform our interested party. 
we will uh, we also have 15 days if we decide we have to post it in the biosafety clearinghouse into include our biosafety clearinghouse as well and uh, we also conduct monitoring monitoring let's mean uh, is part of uh, risk management you know risk management review is about reducing the public outrages you have to compile all information and data those information and data you have to make public aware in order for them to release the outrage uh, and also you can reduce risk by containing risk or confining risk at a minimal level or at uh, environmental level acceptable. So risk management or ALMO, uh, finally, you know, in any way, you, you, you have to do case by case. You cannot do a single rule. You cannot apply a single rule to all ALMO products. You have to do checklist the who to monitor, the operators, who are the stakeholders from the government, who are the stakeholders from society, who are the stakeholders from the operator can take part in the motor, risk monitor. Auditing, is it any required auditing in, in your system? Who to enforce? And we have, we have in Cambodia, we create a central uh, a portal for us, for custom, custom officer uh, who station at the border. Anything import cross into our country, uh, strain suspected to be GMO, they report to us through a BCA. So I think to, that's it to uh, celebrate 15th anniversary of Biosafety Protocol. Thank you very much. Hello? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, Om Kisei for your excellent presentation. We enjoy that. And uh, now we'll go to the next speaker uh, from some Slovenia, Martin Batik. You have the floor. Thank you, Ulrika, and hello to everybody uh, from Slovenia. My name is Martin Batic, and I work with the Ministry of the Environment and Spatial Planning, which is a competent authority for safe and reliable use of biotechnology. Uh, I'm also a national focal point for both protocols. Cartagena Biosafety and Supplementary Protocol on, uh, from Nagoya and Kuala Lumpur. The Cartagena, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and Internet of Force, as Ulrika already mentioned at the beginning of this session, uh, entered into force on 11 September 2003 with the Advanced Informed Agreement procedure for the first imports of LMO GMOs for inter intentional introduction into the environment and the precautionary approach as its key elements ensure the adequate level of protection in the first field uh, in the field of safe handling transport and use of LMOs that may have adverse effect on biodiversity in addition the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur supplementary protocol on liability and redress enter into force 15 years later uh, in March this year, which also aims to contribute to the biodiversity by providing international rules and procedures in the field of liability and redress relating to living modified organisms or GMOs. Therefore, in commemorating the 15th anniversary of the Biosafety Protocol, it is a privilege that the international agreement to ensure adequate biosafety is now completed and congratulations anyway the bus safety protocol and the supplementary protocol liability and redress are detailed agreement among countries in particular 
it is interesting to present some national developments on the recently established supplementary protocol. The provisions of the supplementary protocol are reflected in the European Environmental Liability Directive, ELD, which is incorporated into the Slovenian Environmental Protection Act. The framework of the Environmental Protection Act is the primary law in Slovenia in relation to environmental protection. Let me present the main provisions and requirements of ELD and its implementation in our legislation. Both the ELD and the Slovenian Environmental Protection Act follows an administrative liability approach and not civil liability. Both also cover environmental damage, for example, on biodiversity, water or soil, and not traditional damage, such as personal injury, damage to property or economic loss. The framework, based on the polluters' base principle, on the prevention and remedy of certain types of environmental damage. Legislation requires that those who create an environmental burden to remediate it. An environmental burden is not media specific and includes damage to biodiversity, water and soil. Legislation also prefers restoration in kind. According to the EU ALD, the member states uh, are also allowed to maintain, adopt more stringent rules. In case of Slovenia, the scope of diversity damage in transposing legislation is extended to include national prote nationally protected biodiversity. As I mentioned before, the focus of remedying is on restoration in kind. So first restore and then rehabilitate or replace damaged natural resources and or impaired services. Regarding financial security, providers are encouraged to develop products covering environmental liability, but financial security is not made mandatory at the EU level. The main objective of the ALD is to prevent and remedy environmental damage. This is defined as damage to protected species and natural habitats, damage to water and damage to, so to land. The liable party is in principle the operator who carries out occupational activities. Operators who carry out certain dangerous activities as listed in Annex 3 of the ELD, including contained use and deliberate release of LMOG GMOs into the environment and are strictly liable for environmental damage. Operators carrying out other occupational activities are liable for any fault-based damage they cause to nature but there should be always casual link as a necessary element. Environmental damage is the, in the ELD means any measurable adverse change in a natural resource or measurable impairment of a natural resource service which may occur directly or indirectly. Environmental damage to protected species and natural habitats means that the reaching or maintaining of a favorable conservation status are significantly affected. In case of water, significantly affected are ecological, chemical, quantitative status or ecological potential. And in land, well, land contamination creates significant risk to human health being adversely affected through introduction of substances, preparations, micro or organisms in or under land. The EU ELD define operator as na natural or legal private or public person who operates or controls the damaging occupational activity. The Slovenian transpos transposing legislation does not use the term operator. The person liable for environmental damage under the legislation is the cause of pollution who is with its activity directly or indirectly represent the risk to the environment or cause environmental damage. In Slovenia, the competent authority is the Ministry of the Environment and Spatial Planning. The Environmental Protection Act provides the competent national authority with administrative powers, which ministry and power to require an operator to provide information, require an operator to carry out preventive measure, measures, which means any measures taken in response to an event, act or omission that has created an imminent threat of environmental damage 
with a view to preventing or minimizing that damage. Require an operator and third parties to carry out remedial measures. And this is a duty for operator, which means any action, including immediate control, containment, mitigation, and further prevention of damage to restore, rehabilitate, or replace damaged natural resources and or impaired services, or to provide an equivalent alternative. And for the immediacy, carry out preventive measures and carry out remedial action. Operator has also to bear the cost for preventive remedial action, including assessment enforcement, monitoring, except in the cases where the third party caused the damage, compliance with compulsory order or instruction from public authority, or when member state decided to accept optional defenses, such as permit defense or state-of-the-art defense. Slovenia adopted joint and several liability but hasn't adopted the optional defenses, such as permit or state-of-the-art defenses. Regarding financial security, European uh, EU directive leaves member states to take measures to encourage the development of financial security instruments and markets by the appropriate economic and financial operators, including financial mechanisms in case of insolvency with the aim of enabling operators to use financial guarantees to cover their responsibility. In Slovenia, we don't have legislation establishing mandatory financial security, but the Environmental Protection Act provides for the imposition of financial security requirements on those responsible for environmental burdens. Once again, in Slovenia, the Environmental Protection Act is the primary law in Slovenia, in relation to environmental protection. Legislation transposed to the ELD and provisions of Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol into law in Slovenia are Act on amending the Environmental Protection Act, which was adopted 2008, rules on detailed criteria for determining environmental damage, and decree on the types of measures for remedying environmental damage. Damage to biodiversity is covered by the EPA, but Slovenia has also additional laws on the protection of biodiversity, including Nature Conservation Act, Management of Genetically Modified Organism Acts, and other acts. But these legislative regimes do not cover the prevention or remediation of environmental damage in terms of European ELD. So I would like to conclude my presentation with that the Cartagena Protocol on Bio Safety and the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress are international agreements which promoting safe and reliable use of biotechnology. And thank you. Thank you, Martin Batik, uh, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now we will go to the next speaker. Uh, Mrs. Tsakadzeni, Tsidada. So I give her the floor. Hi, everyone. Oh my God, I'm challenged with the screen. Oh my God. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Can, can you all hear me? Um, yes, we can. Can hear you. I will be presenting about the implementation. Okay. <laughs> I will be presenting about the implementation of the protocol in relation to public awareness and uh, in South Africa. So um, basically, I will just lay a background in terms of 
what is biotechnology as defined in Article 2 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, wherein it is that uh, it's a it, um, biotechnology means any technology application that uses biological systems, living organisms, or derivatives thereof. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. biotechnology Mr. may also be used for genetically modification of um, various products that include uh, crops that are aimed at um, overcoming a range of agricultural challenges and as such yes Mishida, i'm sorry for interrupt you can you put your screen in full screen um Oh my goodness. Or do that, know. just go go you, to the is top. Is it full now? No, go to the top of your of your screen and you can see two um arrows. Okay, that's per no, sorry. Um there is two arrows. So just click on those two arrows in the top of your Okay, um let me just reopen it because oh my god. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupt you. No, it's okay. Um, so I just wanted to indicate. I was in. I was indicating that um, biotechnology might be used for the um, for various uh, products that include um, crops which are aimed at um, overcoming a range of agricultural challenges and such crops may be modified to exhibit traits such as insect resistance, herbicide resistance, abiotic resistance and other more. Um, I just want to also point out that South Africa is regarded as the ninth largest um, GM crops as it's being rated globally and the pioneer in terms of the African region. Um, just to give you an overview on the status of GM products in South Africa, um, in the last growing season, which is also contained in the ESA Brief 53, um, the global status of commercialized biotech or GM crops in 2017. South Africa has planted 2.7 million hectares of GM crops in which 90% uh, 90, um, 90 of such uh, maize, the total area of maize that were, or the um, total percentage of maize that was planted in South Africa, 90% of which it was um, GM uh, maize um exhibiting the the herbicide tolerance and the insect resistance trait and then 95 percent of the of the total of the soya beans that was planted in south africa was also gm and then we have planted 100 percent of um cotton and uh, since 1993 we have uh, issued uh, 393 permits for confined full trial and 10 different cob have been have been issued for insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the number of payments that we have issued to date, it's, uh, in terms of exports, it's 202.156 and import was around 1.869. And commodity clearance, the permit were around 904, and then we've got um, 22 uh, crops that are, um, we've got 22 general release permits, and so forth. Um, in terms of the implementation of the Katakena protocol in South Africa, um, uh, the implementation of the Katakena protocol on biosafety. South Africa, we have acceded to the protocol in 2003 and the Department of Environmental Affairs, where I come from is the national focal point and the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisher is the national competent authority. 
and they are the one that administer the GMO Act, and they are the one responsible for issuing of permits. Uh, to date, um, since the, the ratification of the biosafety protocol, um, we had um, integrated the biosafety activities into our first and the second generation of NBSAP. The first NBSAP was published in 2005 and the second generation was published in 2015. And you can also view them in under the um, CBD clearinghouse mechanism under South Africa. We have also developed an uh, environmental risk assessment framework to guide our risk assessment processes. We have done a general um, environmental framework on genetically modified crops that encompasses all crops. We have done a specific um, guidance document on risk assessment on genetically modified fish as well as pharmaceutical crops. And in 2003, we have established what we call the public understanding of biotechnology program, which is under our Department of Science and Technology. I'm going to go in detail on what um, on the activities of the public um, understanding of biotechnology, which I will also refer to the PAP. And between uh, 2008 and 2010, South Africa embarked on um, bilateral cooperation project with the Norwegian, uh, wherein they even published a report called Monitoring the Environmental Impacts of G GM Maize in South Africa. It's also available on our um, on the on the South African National Biodiversity Institute web website if you want to get hold of the full document and the approach that was used in terms of such monitoring um, of um, such monitoring framework. And then in 2010, South Africa established the Biosafety South Africa, which is um, also established under the, our Department of Science and Technology. And they are also responsible for communicate, uh, science communication. Um, in 2013, we also developed the bioeconomy strategy where in agriculture it's also identified uh, or, or the use of biotechnology on, in agriculture has been identified as one of the strategic element to enhance food production. Um, as Afo mentioned in 2015 we revised our NBSAP and then in 2016, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, which is our um, in the implementing arm of the Department of Environmental Affairs, uh, they have developed a post-market monitoring framework wherein they need to, they were they want to start looking at the impacts of GM of GM crops into the environment, whether there are any impacts. So they want to do it through a research. Uh, it will be a research kind of um, monitoring and they are required by the act to report regularly to the minister of environmental affairs on any impacts of gm in the in the environment um, in terms of the gmo legislative framework in south africa we've got a robust um, regulatory framework we've got um a, 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 our primary legis legislation, which is the GMO Act, which aim, um, which provide measure to promote the responsible development, production and use and application of GMOs in South Africa. Such a legislation is also supported by the um, Foodstuff Cosmetics and Disinfect Act. This is an act that is administered by the um, Department of Health, which will just provide the provision for labeling requirements for GM containing food. We also have the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which is administered by our Department of Labor, wherein they put um, safeguards or it safeguards the health and safety of workers that are working, um, that are involved working in a um, environment which involves um, activities which, with GMOs. We also have the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act, which regulates the, the possible impacts of GMOs 
in the biodiversity and also provide for the monitoring of um, of the post market um, crops that are released into the environment and such as aforementioned is administered by Sanbi. And we also have the National Environmental Management Act, which lays down a minimum requirements that are required when conducting an environmental impact um, assessment uh, for GMO. And um, the National Environmental Management Act also has a provision for public um, uh, consultation. And we also have the Consumer Protection Act, which introduced the mandatory laboring requirements for the GM food. Um, now I will go in detail in terms of the um, public uh, awareness. Uh, it is a requirement in terms of the GMO Act for that for any for the GMO crops that are going to be released in the environment, either for full trial or for, for, for commercial release, you need to to advertise it in a newspaper, a local newspaper, in a national a newspaper, wherein you invite inputs from the public, and such um, inputs they are um, considered as part of the application processes. Um, and access to information is a constitutional right in South Africa. Every South African has a right to information. And it, um, that such provision or such right that is embedded on the constitution, it's advocated by what we call the uh, Batupilo principle. Batupilo principles meaning putting people first. So it has um, uh, eight legs wherein um, you need uh, to consult. You need to give. Uh, you need to conduct consultation with the public. You need to have service standards if you are providing a service to the public. You need to, there need to be a provision of access to information to your offices where, and then there is issue pertaining uh, courtesy information. Then openness, there should be transparency, red rays, and there should be value for money. And um, such is also um, guided or implemented through an act, a legislative framework, which is referred to promotion of access to information act number two of 2000. Um, as, uh, as aforementioned, um, the process of GMO application process in South Africa does um, require the public inputs, which is advertised in the media. And such application, they go through the, the office of the GMO registrar, which is seated in the Department of Agriculture. When such application has been received by them, by, by the registrar is then referred to the um, advisory committee and uh, the advisory committee um, make recommendations that they submit to the executive council. And the executive council is made up of departments that are implicated in terms of their mandate in relation to the implementation of GMO. So um, it it involves a range of departments, which include the Department of Health, Environment, Science and Technology, Trade and Industry, Labor, Arts and Culture, and Agriculture as the convener. And public participation or public inputs are also, they form part of the application process. Uh, I just want to give you um, a case study on public participation of biotechnology in South Africa. This is a study that was commissioned in 2015 with the help of the Human, Resource, Human, Human Research Science Commission, wherein um, I, there was, a, in terms of the, they just wanted to look at how much do the public understand biotechnology in South Africa. And they test a range of, um, 
or, of, um, of, of, of group, like in terms of um, primary schools, uh, secondary schools, they also looked at the metric equivalent um, and tertiary equivalent type of understanding wherein they were asked questions around their understanding in terms of GMOs. And you, as you can see, in terms of who understand the DNA, it's become lower at a primary level, but as the, um, the um, tertiary like as the education and knowledge increases then they are more knowledgeable of the understanding in terms of dna the the genes biotech genetic modification and how do they understand gm food we also tested it in terms of um groupings like those who are 65 years old um, and all that they don't, they don't understand the concept of biotechnology but as they in like um as you go to the higher the the, the lower the age the higher the understanding of um of the concept and also we also ran such the, a survey wherein we asked people how do they want um how do they want uh, biotechnology to be communicated? How do they want information be delivered to them? Some, they, with the most people preferred as a, on a TV, such information can be communicated through a TV, radio, then was the second, and then printed and internet. So that was type, the type of methodology that were used but there are areas wherein we still need um, to, 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 to increase. There is also, I just wanted to give you some of the examples on that we, of publications that we, 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 we develop. Um, we have developed um, the public understanding of biotechnology, which is the PAP has developed a, um, a cartoon type of um, of a pamphlet wherein they were trying to show us um, the public how do people understand biotechnology through the ages. There is one on genome editing that was developed by the biosafety. There is one on the genetically modified plants, why and how we measure risk, which was de uh, developed by our own department. We also did um, uh, an infograph on the 15th anniversary of the Katarina Protocol and biosafety, and all this they can be viewed from the the respective um, websites. Um, we also conduct capacity building, education, and public awareness. There are school awareness that are happening currently, as you can see on the other picture. And we also have um, capacity building workshops that we do with other regulators from other countries that comes as, uh, as to, uh, um, on a, in a form of study tours. There we're hosting um, regulators from uh, Nigeria and Sudan and South Sudan, I think. And also there are um, short courses and uh, courses that are offered on GM technology or in, in different uh, universities in South Africa. I thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Sakatzeni, uh, Tsidada, uh, for your excellent presentation. We enjoyed that. Uh, and we will have the last speaker. Uh, and the last speaker is from Venezuela, Carlos Diaz. Um, just to mention once again that uh, our presentation will be held in Spanish, but on screen you will see the presentation in English. Okay, thank you.
and uh, you're welcome also to continue to send your questions in to Diego or through the little uh, questions chat box on the side. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias. Eh, la República Bolivariana de Venezuela, eh, al conmemorar el decimoquinto aniversario de la entrada en vigor del Protocolo de Cartagena, desea agradecer a la Secretaría del Convenio de Diversidad Biológica por la invitación para participar en, en el presente seminario web. En la mañana de hoy, eh, vamos a presentar los resultados obtenidos, los resultados parciales obtenidos del proyecto de implementación integrada del protocolo de Cartagena, eh, el protocolo suplementario de Nagoya, Kuala Lumpur, sobre responsabilidad y compensación, y el convenio de diversidad biológica. ¿Hay problema? Este proyecto surge como una iniciativa de la Secretaría del Convenio de Diversidad Biológica y el generoso aporte del gobierno de Japón, los cuales hacen un llamado mediante la notificación 040 para que los países expresaran su interés de participar en el mencionado proyecto. Eso fue en, en mayo del 2017. Venezuela presentó su expresión de interés y fuimos seleccionados junto con Cambodia, Camerún, Cuba, Ghana, Mongolia, Nigeria, Perú, Togo y Vietnam. Los objetivos del presente proyecto son desarrollar una sólida comprensión del estado actual de la implementación integrada y la identificación de oportunidades, instrumentos y próximos pasos para una mayor integración de la implementación en el país, incluyendo la participación de actores sectoriales e intersectoriales en este proceso. Además, identificar pasos hacia la ratificación del protocolo suplementario sobre responsabilidad y compensación eh, del protocolo de Cartagena. Eh, ahora bien, ¿por qué Venezuela seleccionó este, este proyecto para trabajar en nuestro país. Adicionalmente a este proyecto se viene desarrollando el proyecto de implementación del Marco Nacional de Bioseguridad con fondos GEF. La idea de juntar o unir los esfuerzos de estos proyectos es desarrollar un marco legal sobre bioseguridad que incluya la organización institucional para regular y controlar los diferentes usos de los organismos genéticamente modificados tras la preparación de la próxima entrada a suscribir el producto suplementario de Nagoya, Kuala Lumpur. En este sentido, el Ministerio del Poder Popular para Ecosocialismo en su carácter de autoridad nacional competente y ambiental en materia de bioseguridad, en conjunto con el Ministerio del Poder Popular para Relaciones Exteriores, es decir, la Cancillería, eh, desarrolla el presente proyecto, el cual pretende unir la acción de las diferentes autoridades nacionales que tienen competencia en el tema de bioseguridad en el país. Para nuestro ministerio, para el Ministerio de Ecosocialismo, se reconoce que la bioseguridad es un tema transversal y que debe lograrse la sinergia entre los ministerios con competencia, tales como el Ministerio de Salud, el Ministerio de Educación, Ciencia y Tecnología, el Ministerio de Alimentación, el Ministerio de Agricultura, Producción y Tierras, y el Ministerio de Industrias y Comercio. La idea es desarrollar a través de este proyecto y del proyecto de implementación la acción conjunta de las diferentes autoridades a través de reuniones, 
Además, el proyecto prevé la consulta y participación de otras instituciones que están eh, de alguna manera relacionadas con la bioseguridad en el país. Por otro lado, prevemos, y ya se realizó en junio, un taller de participación, sensibilización pública. Y lo que estamos trabajando ahora es en la activación de nuestra Comisión Nacional de Bioseguridad. En el presente proyecto, eh, lo que hemos hecho eh, se ha desarrollado en cuatro etapas fundamentales, tales como la preparación y la revisión del estudio por parte de los puntos focales nacionales del Convenio de Diversidad Biológica y del Protocolo de Cartagena. Por otro lado, se llevó a cabo en junio un taller nacional para revisar este estudio por parte de los, de los pares y posteriormente se espera presentar este estudio en un seminario eh, nacional en septiembre. Sin embargo, estamos a la espera de la revisión de la Secretaría de, este, de, la Secretaría de Convenio de este borrador de estudio para finalmente presentar el proyecto, el, el reporte final del proyecto en octubre del 2018. ¿Qué hemos logrado hasta la fecha? ¿Cuáles son las actividades que se han realizado? La preparación del estudio revisado por pares. Ya se recibieron todas las observaciones de los participantes en el taller, que fueron eh, alrededor de 180 personas eh, provenientes de diferentes instituciones nacionales. Eh, entre ellas, el Ministerio de Alimentación, la Universidad Bolivariana de Venezuela, la Universidad Central de Venezuela, el Instituto Pedagógico de Maracay, el Instituto Venezolano de Investigaciones Científicas, el Instituto Nacional de Salud Agrícola Integral, eh, Fundambiente, Movimientos Ambientalistas, Movimientos Sociales, el Poder Popular Organizado, las redes de escuelas de agroecología, entre otros actores importantes. ¿Qué tenemos ahora? Eh, hemos logrado identificar y discutir cuáles son las acciones y las modalidades para promover la implementación integrada del, del convenio de diversidad biológica y sus protocolos a través eh, de, eh, de acuerdo al identificado en el taller, se deben desarrollar planes, programas sectoriales, intersectoriales, los cuales finalmente deben quedar plasmado en una legislación nacional. ¿Cuáles son los procesos y medidas para lograr esta integración? Entonces, eh, se espera que todas las instituciones nacionales que están envueltas en el tema de bioseguridad y biodiversidad puedan lograr una, una integración por una parte, en materia, en, como les había mencionado, en todo lo que tiene que ver con los planes nacionales, y por otro lado, una fortaleza que tiene nuestro país es que ya la bioseguridad se encuentra inserta en el plan de la patria, específicamente en el objetivo 5 eh, de nuestro plan. Por otra parte, eh, la bioseguridad también está inserta en, en nuestra estrategia nacional para conservación de diversidad biológica 2010-2020 y su plan de acción nacional a través de la línea estratégica número 6, la cual habla eh, particularmente del control y fiscalización de los organismos genéticamente modificados. Se tiene previsto además las actividades y acciones para implementar eh, todo lo que tiene que ver con las capacidades la creación de capacidades en materia de bioseguridad y como una fortaleza se visualiza la ejecución del proyecto de implementación del marco nacional de bioseguridad, ya que en el mismo eh, se tiene también previsto la conjunción de todas las autoridades nacionales competentes en la materia. ¿Cuáles son los resultados parciales del proyecto hasta ahora? Eh, la integración... Eh, referida a la incorporación de planes sectoriales e intersectoriales, políticas e instituciones. En el país 
eh, bajo el mandato que, socialista que se viene desarrollando y sobre las bases legales de la Constitución y le, de la ley del Plan de la Patria, se ha consolidado un proceso de cambio político para implementar un nuevo modelo económico productivo ecosocialista, basado en una relación armoniosa entre el hombre y la naturaleza, con una particular importancia en los procesos participativos y toma de decisiones de los actores. Esto es una prioridad nacional, lo cual además viene a apuntalar eh, lo que es eh, la seguridad alimentaria a través de una agricultura sostenible. Venezuela, además de la Constitución y de la Ley del Plan de la Patria, cuenta con el Plan Nacional de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación que eh, tiene como punta de, de lanza que está apoyado en nuestra Constitución. Y además incluye el enfoque participativo y protagónico de todas las comunidades. Entonces, este proyecto además persigue eh, integrar todo lo que son los actores, las circunstancias de la legislación nacional, integrar la bioseguridad considerando eh, todo lo relacionado con el desarrollo de actividades para la aplicación y el reconocimiento de este, de, de lo que es eh, la aplicación integrada del de proyecto junto con el, la, la ejecución del proyecto de implementación. ¿Cuáles son las recomendaciones hasta ahora de lo que ha sido reseñado por los actores en, en, que han trabajado o que han venido trabajando por, con el proyecto? Necesidad de que las autoridades nacionales competentes se preparen para hacer la detección de organismos genéticamente modificados en el país. Adicionalmente, la necesidad de generar un sistema de detección de los organismos genéticamente modificados que pudieran estar ingresando al país. Por último, la visión y el progreso en Venezuela dependerán del trabajo continuo y coordinado, esto es sumamente importante como recomendación de todos los actores, de todas las autoridades nacionales competentes, pero además es importante la unión de voluntades y el enfoque eh, con los distintos actores que tienen que ver con la bioseguridad. ¿Cuáles son los beneficios futuros del proyecto? Promover discusiones con diferentes actores, incrementar la integración entre las distintas autoridades nacionales competentes, un tema identificado eh, como una debilidad eh, es el uso del lenguaje no común entre los actores, por lo tanto se ha generado un, eh, 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 se llama um, glosario este, que, es usado, que será usado con todas las autoridades nacionales competentes competente de manera de armonizar lo relacionado al lenguaje común. Eh, además, revisar lo que son las perspectivas de cada una de las autoridades nacionales competentes y lograr acuerdos para identificar áreas comunes de planificación integrada, sobre todo en el, las políticas públicas del país. Finalmente, como desafíos y lecciones aprendidas tenemos eh, que se identificó generar programas de sensibilización con miras a educar, promover la participación pública y la sensibilización involucrando a todos los sectores, incluyendo organizaciones no gubernamentales, el poder popular, sector académico, los consejos comunales, consumidores, productores, agricultores, entre otros. Además, contribuir con la recopilación de información básica para implementar planes nacionales que involucren a todos los sectores competentes relacionados con la bioseguridad en el, en el país, dado que el país se está preparando a la suscripción del protocolo suplementario de Nagoya, Kuala Lumpur. Realizar talleres con la participación de las autoridades nacionales competentes, públicas y privadas, 
y representantes de la comunidad organizada en general. Con esto, deseo agradecerles a la Secretaría y al apoyo del generoso gobierno de Japón por los fondos para este proyecto en particular y adicionalmente deseamos desearles un feliz cumpleaños al protocolo de Cartagena. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Carlis Diaz, for your excellent presentation. And this ends the list of speakers that we have for this webinar. And we will now uh, start the question and answer session. Uh, and the question and answer session, just to have in mind, uh, please take a, first a few minutes to introduce yourself. First names are fine. And please tell us any relevant information, for example, your organization, interest, influence, involvement. Uh, I'm going to make every effort to keep it uh, within the time frame. Uh, if it's too long, I may, I may have to say that we have to move on to the ne next question. And during the session, all questions and answers are, of course, welcome. It may be quite normal to express both positive and negative statements. Uh, however, I urge everyone to stick to the questions uh, related to the by safety protocol, Katana protocol by safety. And um, yes, I will I'll take the first question that uh, we received. And um, the first question has to do with, let me just, uh, one second, for a panelist. Um, has Cambodia set up any particular provisions to foster information sharing of LMOs between importers and national scientists? This came from uh, Gabriel from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I open the floor to Gabriel if he has anything to add, if he wants to repeat the question. Okay, in, in this case, I will ask Cambodia to answer the question. Is it PCOM? He has set up the initially the biosafety clean house. When we implement the project, the national biosafety framework, what the DNBF, we initially we just develop a project uh, web page. We, imp we input a lot of activities of the project, workshop and so on, output. Then later it come, it move on into the National Biosafety Clearinghouse. The Biosafety Clearinghouse, we put a lot of information from, uh, from project, newsletters, any research, uh, any regulation, any decision, especially into the biosafety clearinghouse. And, 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 and then for short, I think we have to comply to the Katahina protocol because uh, they have the committee to assess compliance of each party to the protocol. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, we have received another question from Nimal Hewanila. Um, not sure if 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 you want to um, repeat the question. One of the questions is, what is water the water access? I assume the question will go to Slovenia, but uh, I will give you the floor. Uh, <coughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. No, I'm just wondering because you know the the. The water is, I mean, I am, I am uh, Nimal, Nimal and I am working, I am actually indigenous people of Sri Lanka and I really believe that all the natural resources are belong to the people. So in that case, uh, I mean, of course, we, I mean, the government or they wanted to privatize the water and I'm just wondering what is the water, they call water policy or something in that country and, and in Sri Lanka we have some kind of um, Kind of um, very um, now it's actually it's, it's very contradiction 
because government want to have all water resources owned by the government so in, in future that they are going to maybe they are going to tax you know even we have a well in your own uh, land that you, you have uh, you have to pay the tax for the government so in that case i just wondering what is this water in your country thank you very much hello hello yeah Oh, yeah. sorry, so yeah, if you're okay. Slovenia, if you would like to answer the question. Yeah, Ma Martin speaking, actually. Uh, thank you very much for a question. Actually, uh, the the uh, Water Water Act and Freshwater uh, Fishery Act are, they are, are related with uh, quality of water and, uh, and that stuff. But in Slovenia, it is not possible to privatize the, the, the water resources, you know? so yeah. it's 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 actually uh, this water uh, act is actually uh, transposed the directive which was written there 2016 you know so yeah so it's, it it's not possible it's, it's already in our constitution that is right uh, which belongs to the people thank, thank you so much uh-huh yeah. Is it possible yeah. to get that uh, vote act? Uh, I mean, uh, I will. Uh, I will ask. I'm not working on the uh, the water uh, department. You know, I'm working with uh, an environmental department. But I will ask my colleagues. And if you send me an email, I will ask my colleagues if there are any 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 translation in English. I don't know at the moment because I could not respond on on that exactly. But yeah, I can pass to to my colleagues. Please yeah, just send you. in mail. You know. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank, thanks so much for the Water Act question. Maybe we can move on. He has two other questions. Just have time to go on, and they are m more related, I, I assume, to to the issue of the protocol. Uh, now, I don't know, uh, Nimal, if you if you meant it to to Martin from Slovenia or for someone else do you allow the public to use gmo products and do you have a labeling system uh, maybe you are, are referring to the to the speech that hatem had from tunisia i will i will give you the floor yeah it's actually <clears throat> i mean when i hear from south africa and you see it seems that uh, they are very much favor on uh, gm product so i'm just wondering uh, you know, because in my understanding, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you GM product uh, is really creating a lot of social issues and the health issues. And uh, so I'm just wondering, I'm mean, South Africa, I know there are a lot of indigenous people and they have a lot, lot of indigenous knowledge on food and varieties. So I'm just wondering, um, how they uh, do they when they pro, when they promoting this GM product? Uh, do they have any any uh, any uh, you know this uh, label system, or uh, do they really wanted to uh, promote GM product instead uh, uh, instead uh, in, uh, product which is uh, how do you call it? You call it local product or you call it traditional? Product with using traditional knowledge. So I'm just wondering how South 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 Africa is seeing it. So Takadzeni, I give you the floor. I think the question is for you then. Hello. Maybe we have some technical issues. Hi, this is Diego. Uh, I would like to ask our presenter to unmute the, the microphone. Okay, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, hello. We, we hear you. Okay. Okay, what I was saying that if um, on my presentation, when I was outlining the GMO legislative framework in South Africa, I did mention two pieces of legislation, which is one is the Food Cosmetic and Disinfectants Act, 
which is administered by the Department of Health, and it does provide for the labeling requirements for GM containing food. It is by it is legislated. It is a requirement, and also there is another pieces of legislation um, for the Consumer Protection Act, which is administered by what the Ministry of Department, wherein it is uh, it provides a provision for the introduction of mandatory labeling requirements of all GM foods. So I had explained it on my presentation. So it is a requirement for labeling is a requirement by the two pieces of legislation. Thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, we will move on to another question. And we'll see here which one we will take. Um, this question is from uh, Mr. Blaise Pinama. Um, not sure if he wants to repeat the question. Uh, I give him the floor to have a chance. The question would be to Cambodia. It seems like Blaze's uh, microphone is not um, developed. Or can you, can you hear us, Blaze? Now, yeah, I can hear can you. you now. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my question was just to ask the Cambodian presenter whether the situation of corruption is still. Yeah, now because in 2012, the corruption was the program, the challenge on improving environmental businesses. So I'm wondering how they undertake risk assessment in a transparent way. Thank you. Let me say you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, Blaise is from Germany. Um, I think, you know, importing of any particular animal into a country is not that easy. If you follow the domestic law because of the risk assessment framework, but businessmen, you know, when they see opportunities, they want whether they want to import to, for food, feed, or processing, or uh, commercial release into the environment, that have to go through a system of risk assessment, which is uh, at lengthy ways, it can take 270 days until it is completed, and maybe beyond, and maybe less than that if they are certain risk assessment has been done for a particular alamo that you uh, intend to import to those countries. But question, your question relating to corruptions in a, when you conduct risk assessment in a transparent manner, the annexity of the protocol suggests for that. And in our biosafety law, also put that into a priority into article. That means when you, when the scientists, the scientific advisory team, we compose a relevant university representative and ministry, when they complete re assessment, report, those reports had to send to Ministry of Environment. The Ministry of Environment, in order to comply to the law on biosafety and to the protocol, we have 30 days to allow civil society the, to help comment on uh, the report. Is within 30 days, this is like public hearing, within 30 days, if there's no comment, then the steering comment committee will convene and the chair of the minister of environment and decide to go to move on so question uh whether or not you know they are uh, moving on into the uh, non what what i can say you know 
non-economic activity rather than you ex uh, express the term corruption which is not nice uh, to those who sit in the steering committee i think uh, it has been difficult and it's not happened in our country yet it may happen in other but this issue you know the uh, the gm crop issue is not that easy even you sell gm crop to the farmer somehow in some country farmers have gone well in terms of wealth you know they're selling products but in some country farmer are committing suicide because they are unable to pay the debt to the seed industry so i think you have to take into account all of this uh, rather than uh, express your concern and this goes to risk management you know risk management is about reducing public outrage thank you Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, we will move on to the next question. We don't have much time also left. Uh, so um, the next question came from Nimal Hawanila. And um, this is to South Africa, we, ass we assume. Uh, how does the government of South Africa see uh, or look upon indigenous peoples, local communities, and traditional knowledge? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, the second question uh, has to do with the, the uh, ministry, but we assume that this uh, is a question more towards Venezuela. So I will give the floor to Nimal to clarify if they want to. If you want to? Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, because uh, uh, you know, as you as as uh, as you are aware that the the traditional knowledge is playing a big role conservation of the biological diversity so in that case uh, and also then in that case indigenous people and local communities also very important if you are thinking about biodiversity and uh, and uh, health so in that case i'm just wondering uh, what is the situation of south africa regarding the indigenous people and traditional knowledge because since you are promoting uh, genetically modified uh, technology so uh, how do you accepting uh, or what is the situation of indigenous people and uh, traditional knowledge I will give the floor to Takadzeni Oh, I, I didn't get his question clearly, but I will try to to answer it. Um, he indicated that um, why South Africa is in favor of the GM, though you are rich with traditional knowledge on food. But um, I've also outlined on the presentation that um, South Africa does have a regulatory framework um, which regulate the use and also the deployment of the technology in a manner that is safe. And we take cognizance of the public participation in terms of the, um, you, uh, on the use of GM. And whether it, when we want to release a GM, we also do a public participation in that regard. So, and we also present you with a choice to, to for uh, in terms of labeling, because all the GM products are being labeled. So you've got a choice to eat something that is a non-GM. So I didn't, that's what I'm saying. I didn't get his question clearly. And we do not have the Minister of People. I didn't understand what he was trying to say about Ministry of People. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, yes. No, the Ministry of, uh, uh, that, uh, no, this is from uh, Venezuela, I think. Ministry of, I mean, you don't have to answer if it is oh. related to the subject. This is Ministry of People Power that is come from Venezuela presentation. And that's interesting. I mean, if, uh, because you know, I'm just wondering you know, what is the Ministry of, Ministry of People Power. It's very interesting in Sri Lankan case. 
Uh, I mean, if not related, to, uh, if not related to the subject, you don't have to. But I'm just wondering, what is the Ministry of People Power? I mean, what is uh, what is that actually? Uh, it's if it's for South Africa, uh, we will we will um, it's and continue. Is it for South Africa or Second Zeni or was it? Uh, um, there, there's a similar ministry in, uh, I think, Venezuela's presentation she mentioned. So, hmm? it's a for Venezuela. Sorry, we cannot. For South Africa. It's for Venezuela. Oh. Venezuela, yes, yes, I, uh, yes, I believe so. Huh? Uh, so I give the floor then to Carlos Diaz to explain maybe then uh, better about this ministry. Um, of um, people's of people. power or people power, people's power. I, I recall that she mentioned this in her presentation. Eh, hola. Eh, para nosotros, eh, recientemente todos los ministerios eh, reciben el nombre del Ministerio del Poder Popular. Y la idea es, el Poder Popular es el pueblo organizado o eh, a través de comunidades, de sus comunidades eh, locales, consejos comunales. Entonces, la idea es que dentro de nuestros ministerios participen todos los actores, particularmente eh, hacemos énfasis en el poder popular organizado. Thank you. I'm going to switch to English. Yes, yes. If we can have the answer in English, it would be great. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Carlis, for your answer. Um, she said that all the ministers receive the name of the of the popular power, which means that the organized people for all the levels, including the you know the local communities, um, participate in the development and in the decisions that the ministries make. Carlis, if si estoy si perdí algo, por favor, déjame saber. No, muy bien, Diego. Eh, es así. Gracias. Okay, so this is this is uh, this is the expression of po uh, popular power means. Yes, thank you. Okay, we thank so much for these questions. I, uh, we have another question, um, and this is from Alex from uh, UN Environment. I will I will give him the floor if he's uh, if he's here if he can hear us and uh, he can answer the and we will uh, ask the question himself and the question is for Tunisia so Mr. Thank you very much. Um, I think that it's just a quick question um, to my friend Hatem. I wanted him to give a. A, a brief explanation on the biosafety caravan. What does it mean? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Hi, my friend. It's a long time. In fact, the uh, caravan of biosafety is kind of um, a serial of uh, cars which uh, make the kind of uh, traveling between institutions which are made in biosafety, for example, the Center of Biotechnology, uh, agriculture institution and uh, during this uh, and um, this kind of caravan it's uh, like a training session in which some officer or some uh, person who are making in biosafety give a student um, a brief overview regarding the issue of biosafety gmos biotechnology and it will organize it in uh, coordination and collaboration with uh, and uh, with the university universal university in institute so this is the, this is the the idea of uh, caravan in biosafety it's uh, and it it will be also um, opportunity to uh, disseminate some outreach materials for example like the guideline regarding biotechnology or the guideline regarding the risk assessment and risk management. So this is the idea. Thank you much. So, so much for your uh, answer. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, 
Now we have reached, unfortunately, the end of the webinar. Um, I, I know we have a couple of questions that came in still. So we will instead urge you to uh, send the questions, uh, or we have the questions. Actually, we will we will answer the questions offline in, instead, since we have reached the time. And uh, just to mention before we end this webinar, I thank so much uh, all the speakers for their hard work over the few months actually uh, to organize, also help organize uh, this webinar for the 15th anniversary of the entry into force of the Catahana Protocol by safety. And we thank all the participants also. Um, and presentations will be made available online and a recording also approximately between one to two days and there will be an email sent out to participants um, and there will be also presentations uh, all in English but uh, if you do request a presentation possibly in other languages uh, especially those that have been mentioned French and Spanish, you're welcome of course to contact us or the presenter uh, to have access to a presentation like that. Um, and, and you're welcome to use these presentations to commem commemorate the anniversary or as promotional materials at, at the national level. Um, and I wish you everyone you know, a great celebration. <laughs> this is a major achievement. Uh, I welcome you also to let us know if you have any celebrations and we will try to make them available online. Um, and yes, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye.